Good morning, everyone. It's almost uh, 10 o'clock. Yeah, we have 14 attendees already. That's great. Um, I'm just going to show you, before I switch to the slides, the cover of this book that we're going to be talking about this morning. It's called Nature's Best Hope. And um, there's a, oh, it looks like a, I'm not even sure what kind of bird it is. It might be a bluebird probably is. And we're going to see a different picture of a bluebird taken by the author, Douglas Tellamy. Um, he's very interested in caterpillars, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So let me go to the slides, and we can begin a recording. Here we go. Um, before we, we get too far into it, I should um, remind you to look at the recorded sessions in the past. Um, I think you'll find them useful. And uh, this one is being recorded now. Next week, um, Christine will send you a special link so that you can identify yourself um, when we start our group discussion next week. And so you'll be using a different link that will, uh, so that you can all be sort of participants instead of attendees. And that's a, uh, should be an interesting uh, thing to do. I'll send you around some notes about it too during the coming week. To get to today's talk, I just happened to stumble across this book and ordered it and found it to my liking and felt that it would be a useful thing to do this week um, to talk because we've been focusing so much on energy and carbon emissions and that sort of thing. And this is something that we can all do or at least aspire to do if we're uh, living in the suburbs anyway. It's a little hard to um, do a lot in your yard if you're right downtown or living in a condo that's right downtown. But, um, and even if you are, maybe you can encourage some of your friends and relatives to take this approach. Um, Tell me is a, an interesting fellow. He's a professor of entomology at the University of Delaware. He took most of the pictures that I'm going to be using um, today. I've taken a few of them and I'll let you know the ones that I've used. Um, he wants to understand better how insects interact with plants and how this determines the diversity of animal communities. He's very much an optimist and it's a bit of, I found his optimism infectious and so I, I hope you'll find it too. Uh, so this is obviously a monarch butterfly that we see uh, nectaring, as he calls it, on an aster. Um, an aster is a broad family of flowers, and this one is quite commonly found in, in many meadows. I had always associated monarch butterflies with milkweed, and it's true that the larvae or caterpillars of the monarch butterfly are obliged to pretty much required, they only survive, I believe, on milkweed plants. But once they're adults, um, they have no interest in milkweed anymore, and they like to feed off of asters and goldenrod. I happen to have my backyard um, um, sort of tilled and some berms made to protect the house from some of the heavy influxes of rain that we've had over the past um, number of years. And in so doing, they, they seeded the lawn with no mow grass seed and grass came up the first year and then gradually other things began to creep in with it. And I just mowed a couple of little paths through it for fun. And then as I read this book, I began to be pleased that I had already started with this and related perhaps a little bit more to the book than, than I might have otherwise. Um, 
So before he gets into the depths of the book, he does talk about three dreamers. And of course, the one that's so obvious to us living in Wisconsin and Madison in particular, um, that we all know is Aldo Leopold. He was born in Iowa in 1887 and he was fascinated with nature. His father taught him to hunt. You see, he has a bow and arrow and arrows, um, a bow in his hand and arrows on his on a quiver in his back here. It looks like he's not in Iowa, but further out west in this photograph. But the idea of that wildlife existed to be hunted was deeply rooted in him and it took him a while, perhaps uh, before and after his coming here to Madison as a UW professor in 1929, that he recognized the vital role of top predators such as wolves and, and uh, eagles and that sort of thing and the importance of a land ethic. This uh, other dreamer, Edward O. Wilson, often referred to as E. O. Wilson, was born the very year that, that um, Leopold came to Madison in 1929. And he, he looked at a number of different creatures, snakes and flies, and eventually chose ants to study in detail and showed the role of pheromones in social insects. And that's how he came to fame, but he continued on uh, beyond that and wrote uh, two quite famous books, The Diversity of Life and Half Earth. I only read the second of those two, Half Earth, and it reminds us that we belong to the biosphere and not the other way around. Um, I think that idea that we're a part of biosphere and should care for it is, um, is an important one that E.O. Wilson has um, done his best to portray. And the third person he touched on, not at the beginning of the book, but later on, is this uh, great 19th century philosopher, Alexander von Humboldt. I had only heard of him as a, a person who studied South America and the currents from, and I didn't realize that he had actually predicted um, uh, the approximation of Africa and South America and that they were once attached. I found that quite forward thinking. And um, he went on to also appreciate that the glue holding nature together was based on the way that species interacted, not just on the list and the evolution of the species. And that was appreciated, but uh, a little bit at the time, but after he died, in 1859, about the time that Darwin came out with his famous theory of evolution, his ideas were forgotten and they're now being recognized uh, um, more for their significance. And I think that's, that's a good thing. He was a, a neat fellow. Um, getting more into the text of the book, it's quite obvious that, that population matters population size. And he has a graph here that shows uh, pretty obviously the population size of a given species. And if there are lots of them, as you see off, up, up, next to the word many, you have a nice wavy line because things in nature have ways of cycles of, of uh, favoring and not favoring a particular species. But if you don't have very many, there sometimes can be a slope to that wavering line and it can go down below a level of, of uh, survival of that species and lead to extinction. We've heard about the sixth extinction and how many of them are happening at this time. People have been very concerned about monarch butterflies because they're well known and there used to be over 10 million of them. Their wintering site in Mexico was only discovered in 1976. And I find that amazing. As a child, I had no idea. And I always wondered how it was discovered and when that they migrated to Mexico and this is mentioned briefly here. Um, but the, the sad part of it is that by seven years ago, over 90% of them had been lost, primarily due to shrinking habitat, uh, fewer milkweed and asters. And that's one of the motivating influences, I think, that is starting people to, encouraging people to uh, try to save the, the monarch butterfly by providing more habitat. I also didn't realize that over 50 partnering groups across the country uh, whose sole mission is to save them. 
have halted their decline. Um, and, um, but they still remain quite vulnerable. This is an interesting little fellow uh, moving from butterflies up to birds. Um, I just found this picture this morning. The one in, um, in Calamy's book is not quite as attractive as this one, so I put this one in instead. It's a rare warbler. Some people call it the uh, gold finch of Texas, but it's not a finch. It clearly has a warbler type bill and song. It breeds in a small area of central Texas and it needs a special tree called the ash juniper. And they use uh, the bark for this tree for building their nests and weave into it some silk from various insects. And therefore they're very dependent upon this habitat in central Texas for their nesting. They winter down in Mexico, but they like the monarch butterfly, but they uh, come up to nest in, in central Texas. Uh, it became uh, apparent that they, they uh, were low in numbers and that they were um, sort of confined to this little niche in central Texas. And so it was reviewed by the Endangered Species Act. And sadly, many private property owners in central Texas purposely removed vital habitat. I find that quite amazing um, that they would do that. Uh, I guess they just don't like to have the uh, federal government involved anywhere in association with their property and they get suspicious perhaps. So they reduced, this reduced of course the birds breeding range quite considerably about 30, 23 years ago. And apparently it's still hanging on. And now I think they may, they may have a chance because I'm told that many birders flock to Texas to see it and that will bring in um, tourism to that part of Texas. So that might uh, save the golden cheeked warbler. I hope so. Um, we have some better news up here in the Midwest that you've probably heard of Kirtland's warbler. It's quite a popular bird named after an Ohio doctor, apparently, Dr. Kirtland, who the bird breeds among jack pines in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Ontario and winters in the Bahamas. And the good news is that for the last 50 years, breeding males, which is I think the indicator that they use during bird surveys, has increased from 167 to over 2000, so that's uh, quite encouraging. Um, I'm not sure why they, I haven't looked for the female, but it may be a little harder to see. They may be more camouflaged, and so they've used the, the male as the marker. We also hear a good bit about the Carner Blue Butterfly, uh, and it uh, depends on the Wild Blue Lupin Flower. It's now, um, it's not doing quite as well as the Warbler. It's extinct in Canada in Indiana, but it still thrives in a little pocket in Wisconsin, the Nesita National Wildlife Refuge, which is just uh, north of the Dells, north and a little west of the Dells by about 50 miles. It's a lovely little place where the whooping cranes were uh, initially uh, taught to fly and follow the ultralights. And so uh, I've been up there a number of times to look at the whooping cranes. I never saw any carnivore butterflies up there, but it's nice to know that they are thriving in that location. Um, then he goes on and talks about uh, the fact that isolation matters. And this is a key to um, his talking about using backyards as, as uh, links from one uh, population to another. And he studied uh, box turtles, um, 91 of them apparently were tagged and studied in an isolated 35 acre forest in Delaware way, way back in 1968. And after almost 30 years, the population had dropped from 91 to 45 and in a, less than another 10 years to 12. And that was thought to be probably due to a lack of, of a corridor between these habitats. Similar results were observed with 12 species of flightless beetles in Delaware. And he, he encourages us to build connections between natural areas to sustain biodiversity. The letters TNC is probably well known to you. Um, I don't like to use these in isolation, but I think we should all learn that it's the, the basic abbreviation for the nature conservancy. That and other land trusts are trying hard to, to build these connections and he speaks very highly of, uh, of the nature conservancy. Um, 
and others. So uh, that's wonderful that uh, they're helping out. Let me just check. I heard an email come through and I wanna make sure that nobody's left out in the lurch. No, it seems, seems everything's okay. So moving on, um, let's um, see about, one of his big themes is turf grass. Uh, he feels that uh, this has replaced native communities across a huge part of, of the United States, an area the size of New England, and we're adding a third of a million acres every year as we build these um, homes and, and put in these beautiful lawns. On top of blocking biodiversity, he says lawns consume water, time spent mowing, and they add toxic chemicals, mostly to prevent a few dandelions from showing up. I, I approve of that idea. I think it's, uh, uh, we're a slave to our lawns far too much. A lawn is the least productive of our plantings and yet it's the default landscaping practice. It's a firmly rooted status symbol of wealth and good citizenship exemplified by our sometimes hero, Thomas Jefferson, who used plants mostly from Asia and Europe, much to Ptolemy's uh, concern. Um, he claims that we can change that culture and preserve turf grass for paths through natural plantings and that attract biodiversity, including insects. And this is an example of a, a lovely uh, center called Mount Cuba Center in Hawkinson, Delaware. And it can guide pedestrians, these uh, little paths uh, through planted landscape without trampling on the tender plants. He also gets a little, as I mentioned in the first paragraph there, a little poetic, and uh, he wonders why why we find these so satisfying. Is there something that genetically uh, in our in our DNA, or is it just culturally determined? He doesn't answer the question, but it's an interesting question to ask. It certainly is a very attractive looking pathway. Um, I'm going to switch from his book for a few minutes to his website. Uh, he makes these five conclusions in a website and asks, what if all insects disappeared? I'm going to take credit for the photograph. This is not from uh, Doug Tallamy, but from my collection of damselflies. I'm quite fond of that insect. And, and those are his big buggy compound eyes up there um, and his uh, thoracic segments leading to these, uh, powering these wings. I'm not sure if you're all familiar with damselflies, but they're about a, um, about a tenth or a fifth the size of a dragonfly. They tend to be either, either beige or blue. And uh, they, they, when they stop, they fold their wings back instead of leaving them spread out the way a dragonfly does. And you'll find them sometimes in lawns, but they really need something more than a lawn to uh, attract them. And uh, a meadow is good, or if you have a mown path through your meadow, you'll see them sometimes creeping out onto the paths. But they're a lovely little creature. He says that most flowering plants would go extinct, which would change the structure of energy flow of most terrestrial habitats if we lost our insects. He says they, um, it would cause the rapid collapse of food webs that support all birds and animals. And lacking insect decomposers, the entire biosphere would rot. Uh, humanity would be destroyed. So pretty dire consequences. He says that insects are resilient and we can all help to restore our insect fauna. And here are three steps we can all take. First, stop spraying pesticides. They're often used by homeowners. And I think this is such a cute little damselfly. We're looking at it perched at the top of a, of a curled up flower head. And it looks like he's waving at us and trying to uh, uh, alert us not to use any more of those sprays. Also, something I have a hard time convincing my neighbors to turn off unnecessary lights. It attracts and kills insects as well as it obscures the stars in the sky. And uh, uh, people have this idea that lights will uh, keep away thieves and marauders and so on. But when they're on all the time, I don't think they do that so effectively. And um, better to have action uh, driven lights rather than have them on all night long. And to landscape your yard with native plants that nurture insects rather than popular exotics. And I didn't know much about that before reading this book. I found it quite helpful. And so now whenever I look for new plants, I make sure that they're native and not exotics. 
uh, from some other country where they will not uh, nurture and support insects so that you have a, um, a stable interaction. And um, further, we, you know, we, we've not been brought up to think of supporting our insect populations, but I think we, we can do so safely. And we'll discuss that a little bit during the, the discussion period. So he comes up with this idea of homegrown national park. And I encourage you to try and remember HNP as the acronym. We have so many acronyms these days. This is not his photograph. This happens to be when I took of the front garden at our house. This is a giant swallowtail. They're pretty rare. And um, I haven't seen this one for a few years, but I was delighted when he came by to enjoy some of the asters in our front garden. He makes some interesting points. I like it. Admission to your park is free. Familiarity with natural cycles in your yard allows anticipation and fosters deep, quiet enjoyment. I'm going to take you on a little tour through Applewood, where I live. Um, last September, you can see on the left the most gorgeous lawn. Um, the couple who live there really uh, take a lot of care of their yard. And when they have to remove a tree, they put a garden in, in its place. And there, it's really beautiful. But you do not see a dandelion in their yard. They never have a dandelion, and they never have a weed of any kind. Uh, so um, I've been trying to encourage my fellow Applewood residents not to use herbicides, uh, because uh, we have two wells <clears throat> down about 250 to 300 feet below these lawns. And ultimately, even though we're sitting on glacial till, we don't know exactly how dense that till is and how long it will take those herbicides to get into our drinking water. We have it tested regularly and so far so good. We don't even chlorinate it or fluorinate it. But um, whatever I've said is, does not apparently make a, 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 any difference at all. And all the people who use herbicides, who have used them continue to do so. But we do sell our properties from time to time as we age and young couples buy them. And the house on the right was just purchased by a young couple with children. And I actually stopped and met the newcomers and congratulated them on their lawn full of dandelions. I think they look rather pretty. I want to draw your attention to the side yard, almost in the center of that photograph, just to the left of the house. That's a yard of birch trees and other trees. And it's just full of buckthorn, and it's been allowed to, as the previous owners who were an aging um, couple um, lost their, their health, um, they neglected that part of the yard. And so the newcomers decided to tidy it up a bit. And then since they have young children, uh, this is what it looks like now a few months later. They've used gravel. I would have preferred personally a little, a bit of lawn or turf there, but uh, they have all kinds of little memorable things for their kids to play with and, and little plants and things that they can enjoy um, as they learn about nature. <clears throat> In the background, you can see uh, there's a geodesic dome and some various things for the kids to play on. But it's nice to see young couples move in and do things relating to nature uh, for the family. This is my own yard. I think I mentioned to you that um, that I it, it had some berms made and decided to let the, the grass grow. And before I knew it, I had in the following spring, um, all these daisies. And I used to mow a few of them down. And after a while, I thought, gee, they're rather pretty. And way at the background there, you can see wild asters coming up. And that's a path back to my compost heap. So um, I don't compost everything from the kitchen there, but everything that gets pruned uh, goes back there and it's formed a nice little area for the cat birds, which I'll show you later, and um, rabbits and all kinds of creatures uh, uh, behind the last apple tree. The coming to the right, you see near the compost and looking back toward the house in the driveway, you see the reverse view and up above it, uh, the same view as the first one uh, later in the year when the goldenrod take over uh, from the daisies. So I rather like this uh, um, new hobby of mine, just to enjoy strolling through 
uh, trimming and admiring and, and supporting and encouraging the things that I like to have back there. But I'm learning a lot from this book as I do so. Coming a little further afield, um, you've heard Tony Praza talk about the Pope Farm Conservancy that's out on Alt Osalk Road, um, about a mile or two west of, um, well, it's, let's say two or three miles west of the Beltline is the easiest way to, to remark it. These sunflowers became so popular that it was almost too popular for the good of the, of, of the conservancy. There was too, diff too much difficulty parking. And after a couple of summers, the second summer was pretty chaotic. They decided not to do it again. And so they have it as you see it on the right. Um, uh, there's a beautiful stone wall with lovely trees and they have a variety of, of crops that are grown beyond that stone fence. My grandson chose this spot to get married a month ago and uh, we were delighted during COVID to be outdoors and enjoy the beauty of the conservancy and put on our masks only as we got a little closer uh, together for some photo taking or, or dining, picnicking. But it's a, it's a great uh, location and I encourage you all to enjoy it. Uh, coming a little further afield, this is my favorite place outside of Madison that I call Cactus Bluff and Fairy Bluff. Cactus Bluff is halfway up the hill uh, from Highway 60 that goes along the North Shore of the Wisconsin River west of Sauk City. And you can see some people uh, standing there um, somebody sitting on the rock and someone else there. Uh, as I fly by, we're waving to one another. And this is, uh, these are some fascinating um, portrayals of plant life, animal life, and former Native American life in these panels here that you can um, learn from a lot about the history of the area. If you walk back up with a little trail, and then up through the oak savanna, following my arrow here out to the tip, then you come to Fairy Bluff and the view from here uh, overlooking Cactus Bluff and the, the Wisconsin River on its way toward Mesomini is really a lovely hike. So I recommend it highly. It is closed from the 1st of November as of yesterday then until late March uh, for bald eagle nesting, but uh, is open the rest of the year. And of course, uh, some of you in the audience will recognize yourselves from that day about, uh, I guess it was about a year and a bit ago that we met with Allison Duffy here on the left with the map of the Sauk Ferry Conservation Alliance and uh, Charlie Luthen, who was the primary organizer. He gave a talk to our group and then gave us this tour a few months later. And I think we all enjoyed that a lot. Uh, so that's another uh, area for appreciating nature. And uh, before we get back to the book, I will show you the gray catbird. I, I didn't take this picture. Uh, I can't claim to be that good a photographer. Most pictures that you see of catbirds are taken from a little lower. They're shy and they tend to be up in, in small branches and not so easily visible as this one was by the excellent photographer. I just love the shape of the bird, the subtle colors, and just the clean lines. It's uh, mostly people hear it because um, it makes a mewing, kind of a meow sound when it's annoyed. Uh, and it can be annoyed when people get too close to it or walk through its territory. And so that's what you often hear. <coughs> but if you have a, a compost area as I do, um, it's quite happy and it, it loses some of its shyness and comes out um, much closer to our house. And we found a, a, a variety of songs that we've not heard in any other bird. I haven't heard a mockingbird since I lived in Kentucky in World War II. So um, that's a long time ago, but I, I would suggest that it may compete favorably with a mockingbird for a variety of song notes that are just lovely to listen to uh, both in the morning and the evening. Um, they feed on quite a variety of 
berries and ants and beetles. And they're part of the whole idea of the, of the um, natural cycle of insects and flowers and birds. Um, so I, I find them one of the delights of my yard. Um, this is a, uh, a slide from Doug Ptolemy. And it's, uh, he, he goes through the seasons and points out the spring peepers on the upper left, um, the gray tree frogs on the upper right. And those are sort of things that we don't often see. You have to really hunt them out if you're a reptilologist or an amphibianologist. Uh, the white lined sphinx moths uh, I see from time to time. They can hover like hummingbird moths. Um, and then the juncos in the lower left. There are many subspecies of juncos and they're common across much of North America. Um, so those were the, the four species that he chose to try and encourage us to enjoy the variety of the seasons. Then he talked about a special uh, thing called the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. Um, about almost 20 years ago, 1360 scientists worked around the world at the state of the Earth's ecosystems and their ability to clean, stabilize, and pollinate the planet. And it looks like we've already beat uh, um, what E.O. Wilson would have us do, and that is save 50% for the wildlife. Uh, according to this, we've destroyed 60% of our ability to support ourselves. Um, not quite sure how they define that, but um, it's a, a sobering statistic. I was impressed with these photographs. I've seen a few stellar jays when I've been visiting out west, but I've never seen one as striking as that fellow. Uh, the chestnut, uh, Lewis's woodpecker in the upper right, I've never seen, and uh, nor the chestnut backed uh, chickadee. Um, we have lots of chickadees in our yard, and I'm sure you do in yours too, but I've never seen, and I think these are all restricted to the western part of the country. Um, coming to some theory here. He wants to, do, he describes what's called the carrion capacity. And if you look at the time on the abscissa and population size on the ordinate, and this is the population, you'll see that it can go up and up and up to a certain point and it will exceed as it crosses this dashed line, what's called the carrion capacity for that ecosystem. And as it exceeds that, of course, its population will, will uh, peak and start to come down. And only when it gets down to a point where the carrying capacity, which has been recovering, uh, suffering, but starting to show signs of recovering, will, these lines will cross and the population will go down and gradually they'll come back up again. Um, so he, he points this out, this applies to landscapes and determines the abundance and diversity of animals that can live there. So it's something to keep in mind as background for understanding and appreciating the cycles of, of life within um, communities. And he, he talks about uh, various predators. Of course, we all hear about house cats. They can kill up to 4 billion birds a year in this country. It's a pretty amazing statistic. Uh, we have a, a cat friend who says, a cat loving friend who says, oh, well, those are all just the, the old debilitated birds. But I think that they uh, do more than that. They're, but in any case, it's something to be aware of if you have a cat outdoors. Our cat doesn't want to go outdoors, so we don't have any problems there. Then we have the hemlock woolly edelgid. It's a species that's native to Japan, but of course it's come in here uh, with uh, almost eliminated the hemlock trees from the southeastern part of the country. We've all familiar with the gypsy moth. We see the caterpillars sometimes and do our best to destroy them. Um, um, They've defoliated North American forests repeatedly. And then we're so familiar with the emerald ash borer, uh, believed to have entered the country and wooden packing materials from China. Oh, how China, we love to blame China for so many things. So this is an interesting little historical bit. When humans colonized the Polynesian islands 4,000 years ago, uh, 800 to 2,000 species were lost to hunting by humans. And of course the rats that came along with them in their boats. So uh, we really have done havoc and um, uh, with uh, 
our creatures and especially some of the islands where particularly around New Zealand, some of the birds, for example, uh, lose their, their ability to fly because they, it's a pretty energy intensive uh, part of the bird and they sometimes, uh, if they don't need to fly, then they lose that ability. And of course, when the rats come along so much for the uh, non-flying birds. Um, what are some invasive plants? Uh, people ask that a lot and I certainly do. Um, people get very upset about the idea of invasive plants. We have some garlic mustard as you folks probably do. And people get really upset about garlic mustard. Um, and people have various levels of, of concern with them, um, but they're defined as non-native. And the, the key is that they displace native plant communities. He points out they are not to be confused with fast growing native plants. And he doesn't seem to have so much of a problem with native plants, but some of the non-native ones uh, really are a nuisance. And he gives some examples as shown in this photograph. And, and I've taken the legend of the photograph and enlarged the wording so you can see it here. These are autumn olive. I think there's also one called Russian olive, um, multiflora rose, bush honeysuckle, oriental bittersweet, barberry, and burning bush. We have some burning bush around our house and it's rather attractive, but we certainly uh, I don't want it to take off and make sure that we don't see it taking off uh, elsewhere around the property. But there's something to be uh, um, watched and, and pruned back. Um, the author and his wife apparently spent a good bit of time when they bought their property to um, uh, tidy it up. So this is a hedgerow in Maryland that's been invaded by these plants and um, they can, if not, uh, trim back, uh, really take over. Um, Doug has a graduate student, Desire Narango, who, who used video cameras to analyze the vegetation and bird foraging around the Washington, D.C. And she discovered that nesting and egg laying in areas dominated by native plants were more successful than in areas dominated by introduced plants. Excuse me just a second. So while um, this might not be too surprising, these data really remove the guesswork from appreciating the importance of ecological balance provided by native vegetation. So he's really keen on, on promoting that and avoiding uh, introduced plants as much as possible. And, and it goes along with his uh, students' um, evidence that uh, you have better ecological cycles and nurturing of the, of the birds and insect life by um, doing that. This was his, a picture I promised you from the front cover of his book. This is the bluebird. It's a lovely shot of one. Uh, he points out that caterpillars are the mainstay of most bird diets in North America, especially when they're, they rear their young. And that may be, I'd, I was either ignorant of that before or just never thought about it very much. You could see the caterpillar in its beak. He says, bluebirds rely more on caterpillars than any other food source. And that may determine um, a good deal the time when birds um, migrate back to an area at a time when the caterpillars are most common. And it could be the climate change uh, when affecting uh, the timing of the caterpillars could interfere a bit with uh, the um, optimum uh, use of caterpillars. Um, he's asked, why are caterpillars so important? And he points out that they're soft, easy to digest, loaded with fat and protein, perhaps a lot more than the earthworm is for robins, although the robins seem to manage pretty well. Um, they're also an important source of carotenoids, which improve color vision, sperm vitality, and immunity. And in birds, the carotenoids provide a major component of colorful feather pigments. So I didn't know that before. And you can see that caterpillar having a good time chewing up that leaf. And um, uh, the idea is to have a balance so that the leaves are there. Um, some of them make toxin to protect themselves. The caterpillars feed on them, but their population is controlled by birds who are uh, eating insects other times of the year, 
And so there's, there's this lovely balance in nature that we can see in our own backyards. Uh, people ask him also, well, what are the best plants or trees to nurture caterpillars? And he says that the oak tree is, supports over 500 species of caterpillars. And when fully grown, most larvae fall to the ground and pupate on the leaves or plants up to 25 yards away. And the shrubs and flowers nearby provide loose organic matter as well. I've never seen this caterpillar before. It's a spun glass slug caterpillar. It's one of 557 species of caterpillars in the mid-Atlantic states that develop successfully on oak trees. So kind of a cute uh, number there. Uh, what, he has also the question, what is a pollinator? He says to assume that any creature seen in a flower pollinates, it is wrong. This is a picture that, that I took of a, of a tiger swallowtail, again on the asters uh, back on this case. Um, true pollinators must transfer pollen from the male stamens to the female pistils. Uh, which you can sort of see in these in these asters, the stamens around the periphery and the pistil right in the center. Butterflies get a lot of credit for nectaring of flowers, but they pollinate only a little. Um, still, we need to nurture both uh, uh, the pollinators and the nectars. Some flowers have developed elaborate shapes, um, and that may apply here a bit, uh, to block generalist pollinators and allow access only to Specialist bees. Well, they're not blocked in their access, though, but uh, but they undoubtedly do some pollination while they're nectaring. The real pollinators, of course, are the native bees that maintain a diverse uh, base for terrestrial food wife, life web. Sorry. Up at the top right is a European honeybee brought here by colonists and now suffering from colony collapse disorder. But there are up to four thousand different native pollinators. The sweat bee on the left is included here, uh, the bumblebee on the right, there are leaf eating bees, there are uh, all kinds of different bees. And my daughter kindly uh, encouraged me to nurture them by sending me, uh, giving me a little bee hotel, which I've attached to an apple tree in the backyard. Um, the author goes on to, to say that you should keep your hotels fairly small, otherwise some of the predators of bees um, might discover them there and could spread and infect a larger population. So he recommends keeping the bee hotels like this fairly small and scattered through your yard if you have a, a fair sized yard. Um, and then Mrs. Tallamy asked the author what species would suffer if she weeded the goldenrod from her garden. And uh, when he replied, 110 species of caterpillars would suffer many beetles and 35 bee species uh, not to mention that supporting the monarchs, which do love to eat that flower uh, as an adult. I think she uh, decided not to do too much weeding of goldenrod, at least I hope so. Other helpful pretty weeds don't deserve the name weed, he says. They include the Joe Pye weed, the tick weed, and many other things that he says weeds are really defined as, as weeds as plants out of place. It's like trying to define the word immigrant. I think that's a very clever <laughs> relationship. Uh, we have that problem when we think of, begin to think of ourselves as immigrants. Uh, at least we're viewed that way by the Native Americans. Um, and here's pictures of the Joe pie weed. I have a fair bit of that growing amongst the goldenrod. I don't know if I have any tickweed or not. Tickweed is a very broad name. I don't think it has any relation to ticks. Um, uh, but this is one example. I think there are about 30 or 40 different types of tickweed. Uh, so it's just sort of a slang word, I think. Um, I took this picture of uh, from his book, and that's a picture of him with his camera and backpack. That is a boardwalk right, recently built right through the heart of Manhattan, New York. Uh, he points out that um, it's not a pipe dream and that healing can be very fast if we give nature a hand that we're already managing most of our privately owned lands and we simply need to include ecological function in our management plans to keep the sixth mass, mass extinction at bay. Um, so he, he has a lot of optimism and um, he thinks that nature's resiliency is, is uh, truly there to help us. We just, it needs a little more help from us sometimes. Um, so what can we do? Uh, we're gonna talk next week about what can we do to help the planet but if we ask the question, what can we do in relation to the um, 
the ecology of our of our yards, the the flowers, insects, and birds and their interrelationships. And he said the first thing you can do is shrink the lawn. Um, the second thing is to remove the invasive species that we've talked about. And he talks about planting keystone genera. I'm not enough of a botanist to give you a good definition of that, but I encourage you to go to his website or his book to define that better. Be generous with your plantings. Try and plant uh, um, things that are native to the area and that tend to support um, some of our insects. Plant for specialist pollinators, the bees in particular. And then he gets to these other things like networking with your neighbors. Uh, that can be challenging, but um, uh, he, he doesn't say persuade or twist arms. He just says network. And I think that's a very good word. Uh, if you want to maintain a good relationship with your neighbors, build a conservation hardscape. Um, I think by that he means to try and have your own um, home um park uh, create caterpillar pupation sites under trees and don't spray or fertilize with chemicals and then educate your local civic association um, there's a nice little picture that he had of the monarch butterfly caterpillar and you can see it eating its way along a piece of milkweed it has an ability to detoxify the toxins in the milkweed and most other um, insects do not have that ability. And so it's, uh, it sort of leaves the plant all up to that species, but then the species becomes dependent. And when milkweed tends to grow a lot along the roadsides and people, um, our farmers in particular are using <coughs> um, broadband chemicals to eliminate everything except uh, what they want to grow, the corn and soybean, it can be really hard on the on the monarch butterfly and many other insects. So um, uh, my wife passed this little thing along to me yesterday and I put it here as a, as a Native American proverb. We do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. And I think many of you have heard that. I'm, I'm not sure if it's Chief Oshkosh who said that or, or some of the other Winnebago, but it's a fairly well-known phrase among those of us who are interested in nature. And I invite you to ask some questions. I will try and um, open it up. And um, I do have a slide here of some questions that he asks, but rather than uh, that, we can go back to that. I've got a printed copy and I can deal with that a little bit later, but I'd like to give you first dibs. So let me um, close this for now and see if we can um, go back to our questions. Okay, let's have a look at Q&A and see what we have here. Um, no open questions yet. Try the chat, nothing there. I can start with uh, some of his questions, but I'd like to see your show up. He has a, a page of frequently asked questions. We've got 18 of you out there, so come on and pass them along. Let me start with the first one. Um, the first one he has is, won't climate change make restoring natives to our landscapes nearly impossible? And he answers, Climate change is certainly exacerbating the many pressures we humans have already put on plant and animal communities, and it won't make restoration efforts any easier, but we shouldn't use climate change as an excuse to do nothing. Most species of plants and animals are far more resilient to climate variability than we give them credit for. Uh, I see Mert has, what are the six mass extinctions? And I'm sorry, but I cannot answer that question very well for you, Mert. You might be able to. Uh, I haven't really studied that. I haven't read the books on mass extinctions, but I think um, the mass extinctions relate to time. The first one was probably 70 million years ago when an asteroid hit the uh, Yucatan Peninsula. 
and there may have been some before that, I'm not sure. There have been uh, apparently about five others between then and now, and we're in the middle of the sixth one now. So that's what I mean by mass extinctions. There's a, um, a woman, is it Elizabeth Corbett or something like that, who's written a book, a famous book that's quite popular now called The Sixth Mass Extinction. And you can probably Google that and, and pull it out of a website. So I defer or encourage you, I should say, to try uh, Googling that and you'll get a better answer to that question. Uh, Dorothy Boatman asks, does he have an organization that supports his strategies for homes and local parks? I'm not aware of one, but I encourage you to get on uh, to Google uh, Douglas Tallamy. That's Douglas with one S in Tallamy, T-A-L-L-A-M-Y. He's written another book called Bringing Nature Home, which is very close to this. Um, and, um, but I'm not aware of any local organizations. I think the Nature Conservancy is a broad organization and there are lots of conservancies around that are, that are um, um, active. Um, and so it's fun when you get involved with an organization um, such as, for example, the Pope, the Pope Farm Conservancy or, um, or any other local, uh, there are a number of local conservancies that are quite active. Um, and uh, so it's fun to get involved directly with one. Of course, uh, uh, there's a sort of a conservancy, the Sauk Prairie Conservation Alliance. That's uh, another one, but how closely those support um, telling me strategies I'm not so sure, and I think his strategies mostly apply to the areas around Delaware. Um, so, uh, but you can try checking out his website. Um, Kathy Berman asks, is there any herbicide that is safe? We are trying to encourage nature plantings in our property, but non-natives keep taking over if left to their own. Um, I don't think there is it, it's possible to define safety in relation to an herbicide. Um, the latest one, uh, glyphosate, that people use a great deal, uh, is thought to be associated with the development of lymphomas. There's no proof, but already the manufacturer is apparently involved in litigation and is, is uh, 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 paying some people to stop suing them. And um, so there's some evidence. I certainly would um, use it with great caution, particularly where I live, where there is a, um, where there are wells a couple of hundred feet down um, to our drinking water. But uh, I don't think that glyphosate might be quite so dangerous in our wells as it would be uh, in direct handling. And I think any of these herbicides need to be handled with great care. Um, wearing gloves and if, if sprayed, uh, wearing a mask and so on. Um, but I don't think there's any uh, herbicide that will select between native and non-natives. I think it's mostly a matter of pruning. Uh, when I harvest uh, the uh, um, what's that weed that I mentioned before? Um, it's an introduced weed that grows in the shade and is low. Garlic mustard. Um, I don't attempt to spray that. I just um, pull it out. It, fortunately, it pulls out by the roots. It takes two years to seed. And so if you get a lot of it, uh, well, it's still uh, a low plant and just easily pulls out. Uh, and, and people around Applewood certainly do that. So that's a non-native and, and it's quite aggressive and can simply be pulled out uh, manually uh, without any herbicide. My daughter Rachel is on. Good to see you, Rachel. She says, is, is his website you mentioned the Center for Humans and Nature? And my answer to that is probably yes. I did go on and find his website and it seems to me that it did have that name. So thank you for that answer, Rachel. I think you've probably got us on the right track. So it's called Center for Humans and Nature. Give it a try and if you see um, Doug Tallamy's name associated with it, then 
Rachel gave you the right answer. So thank you. Uh, Rachel also has another one. She says, Audubon also has lots of great resources for attracting birds to your yard, which are highlight, well, also highlight planting native plants. So that's very true. And many of us are either members of Audubon or can even get on their website and, and they do have um, uh, very good points. Um, Mert asks, what are your thoughts about working with the Arboretum? Great uh, question, Mert. I really um, like that idea. Um, my son got quite in interested in that when he was uh, at university here and did work with him for a while. And he was very, very pleased to, uh, to do that. I think it's a fine organization. I have uh, enjoy walking there. Uh, their bookstores are wonderful. It's a great resource. And of course, uh, um, harkens back to a great professor of, of ecology. Um, Dorothy writes, she says, when I volunteered with the Conservation Alliance of Badger, we pruned brush and a tropical hills her herbicide was carefully painted on cut stumps. That's true. And I think um, that was probably, uh, that topical herbicide was probably uh, glyphosate. And um, uh, it seems to be the one that's used most often and can be applied uh, uh, carefully so that they won't grow back. Um, it's, I think it's more effective for some plants than others, um, but it certainly can be tried. And, and um, when you just prune the brush and don't want to have to come back every year, uh, it's a good way to reduce the likelihood of regrowth. So thank you for that. Um, there are a couple of other questions on here. I appreciate your input. You're a great group for that. Um, the, the next question is, I have heard that invasive plants disrupt ecosystems. Are ecosystems really so fragile that a single invasive plant can harm it? And he said, yes. By its very nature, uh, an invasive plant does not stay like a single tumor, it spreads. And like this analogy of cancer, by definition, invasive species do spread and displace native plants and animal communities wherever they go. Um, there's another question here that I was, I find interesting. I live in an area, says the questioner, with lots of Lyme disease. Several websites suggest keeping large lawns because they're not attractive to ticks. The sites also say I should get rid of brush piles because ticks love them. How can I contribute to a homegrown national park without getting Lyme disease? And his answer is quite interesting. He says, whenever I hear this question, two platitudes immediately pop into my head. One, life is not risk-free. And two, life is a trade-off. It's true that a lawn will not support a large tick population or anything else, and pavement supports even fewer ticks. To create a world with no ticks, we could turn everything into lawn or pavement. The risk from Lyme disease would drop to zero, but so would the probability that we will persist on this planet much longer. Let's think about what deer ticks need to complete their life cycle, and then think about the easiest way to disrupt that cycle. Deer ticks do not uh, eat native plants or leaf litter or brush piles. Ticks stay in brushy areas because they need high humidity. Deer ticks do not do eat mammals, or at least their blood, and two of their favorites are white-footed mice and white-tailed deer. Although Lyme disease has always been around in very low frequencies, it reared its ugly head in the 1970s because white-tailed deer changed in abundance. Because too, uh, too many deer are bad news for the environment, reducing deer numbers might seem like the best place to interrupt the Lyme disease cycle. We need to agree collectively as a society that having too many deer is not okay and that it's not something we have to tolerate. Um, we get some deer uh, browsing through our yard, particularly during apple season. They came um, a little less than a month ago and they browse up and down the driveway, even though we're in the inner part of the circle. Um, and we kind of enjoy the deer, but I don't think that they leave that many ticks behind. I used to come home after pruning in the, in the backyard uh, meadow 
uh, with um, oh, three or four ticks a season. I haven't had any on me the last couple of years. And I think it's uh, partly the use of more herbicides by my neighbors, um, but I'm not really sure. Um, I think there is a, there are fewer insects as well as uh, uh, in general in, in many yards. So I think we should all be vigilant, but uh, I don't think it's a, a major problem. And he had an interesting way of looking at it within the perspective of, of uh, risk to ourselves. Well, it is 11 o'clock. I see a couple more questions here, I think. Oh yeah, um, my, my daughter Rachel has another, another thought. She says, your local university extension office, UW extension office can be a resource for how to manage invasive plants. Hopefully some options will exclude herbicides. So thank you, Rachel, for that. Um, also, um, uh, I think Doug's website, also the book is a delightful read. And um, I think if you want to get it from your library, um, he has two of them. There's not only um, Nature's Best Hope, which you see here, but there's also one called Bringing Nature Home. So either one of those books by Douglas Tallamy, I think you can find at your library and he can provide also some information. But I think uh, your advice, Rachel, about uh, University Extension is a good one along with the Audubon Society and uh, um, uh, also the, um, um, the, the Arboretum. Uh, it can be a good resource too. So thank you all for your input. I've appreciated it. And um, uh, I found it a refreshing um, book to read and learn from. The other thing uh, that I should remind you about is that uh, next week, we will do something we've never done before. Um, and that is try a group discussion. This is not a panel discussion. This is a group discussion. So we're not setting up a panel. Everybody will come on board with a new um, link. You keep the old link that you use today for subsequent talks, but uh, for next week, we'll get a new link. And I've, I'm, I'm going to send to Christine, the coordinator, each one of your names and email, emails on a list. And she will individually write to you. And in this way, um, when you come in, you will have your name automatically associated with your image. And that will save you time uh, so that you won't have to correct your name and change it from mine to yours. And that way we can have a group. And if we have about the same number as today, about 14, uh, that's fine. And with me, that'll make 15 or so, and but she'll send it out to the full group of us, which I think is about 38. And who knows, my guess is we'll probably have uh, the same 14 regular attendees, but we might get more. Um, it might appeal to more and perhaps less to others. Um, I have a list of uh, 10 things you can do to protect nature from um, a recent uh, magazine. Um, called Defenders, Magazine of Defenders of Wildlife. And I'm going to go through some of these uh, next week, but I want you to bring some of your ideas and um, uh, I think we'll have lots to share and discuss. Um, that way we'll get real participation here and I appreciate that. I see a couple of chats before we close. Let's see what comes up on chat. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm able to do that. Um, I think we've got all of the all of the question and answers. Anyway, I appreciate your input today, and uh, it's lovely uh, to see all your names and and um, know that you're out there. And I think next week uh, we can get much more uh, have much more interaction. I think I sent to you, but will remind you that um, uh, Scott Kolar has posted um, the previous 
um, meetings on the website. I think I sent you that link, uh, the Plato Madison website, and um, you can find most of them there. I know that Doug's uh, a discussion of of uh, En-ROAD with uh, Phil Smith is there. And um, I find it a little difficult to get on the En-ROAD website. And I think that just to go back through that um, webinar that we had a week ago is a nice demonstration. Um, if you have difficulty with the website as I did um, to um, review through how he demonstrated so effectively the many different factors that contribute to climate change. So have a good week. I know you've all voted, uh, but if you haven't, I sure hope you do. And uh, um, we won't spend much time getting into politics uh, with Plato, uh, but I, uh, I hope we're all very happy next Monday. I'm sure hoping so too. So have a good week guys and gals and we'll, we'll see you then. Bye-bye now.